Shabbat Shalom, everyone. It's Rebecca Levis here, and we're going to study Torah together. We're in the book of Leviticus. And before I start, I just want to share a little quick story with you. Uh, last week, I met a friend of mine, and we were talking, and I was explaining to her how in my life, personally, that I could look back on my life and see all the things that God created in my life and in me to dovetail to a divine calling. And she looked at me and she said, I don't think I know my calling. And here I am, you know, 70 years old. And I thought, wow, so many people don't know why they were born or why they're here. And so I made some suggestions to her that perhaps she was a gift to somebody else. She had never considered that one. So anyway, I liken that to very much what we're going to be learning about today, which is God's call. Now, God's call is to everyone. However, not all accept his words when he calls and respond, but they reject his call and turn away. And that's exactly what our study is all about today. And that God came into time to call people to himself. Did you ever think about this, that without time, there is no faith and there is no hope? Because faith and hope is in something that hasn't occurred yet. So we have to wait until it happens. And that's why God stepped out of eternity into time and space and presented himself to mankind in the Old Testament as fire, his presence, and in the New Testament in the Messiah, Yeshua. So I'm going to be tying those two together today. So um, this is a great study. I hope you join me. Perhaps listen to this while you're out walking or at the gym. Put on some headphones and listen to it maybe in two sections because it is foundational to our faith. So let me share my screen and we'll get started today. So this is the typical prayer that said prior to Torah study. And if you're following me in our workbook, A Year Through the Torah for Christians, it's on page 22. And it's in the blue, but I'm not going to go over it now because I have a lot to share today. But it talks about focusing and busying ourselves with God's word. And we're going to end this study today talking about the Messiah being the manifestation of the words given to Moses and then spoken by the Messiah. So I'm going to bring those two together and hopefully you can see the connection today. So we're in a parasha or a portion of scripture called Imor. Imor means to speak. And it's in Leviticus 21 through 24, 23 is what we're going to be studying today. So let's get started. Here is what I like to call this section of scripture, a roadmap to redemption. So what does that mean? Okay, so we're going to look at a lot of things that today in our culture, we don't practice anymore. Because first of all, we're many of us in the Gentile church, and we've lost a lot of their tradition. But also, um, we don't understand a lot of the symbolism from the Old Testament or the Old Covenant that God made with Israel. So today, what we're going to be covering, I'm going to quickly pass through just to familiarize you with some of these things like the priesthood and the rules, things are acceptable, unacceptable to God, the Sabbath, the feast days, and um, it ends with a blasphemer, blasphemer being stoned. Now, it, it begins with life, basically, God's life with his people that is revealed within the tabernacle, and it ends with man's death. So that's really a picture of history. Man in the beginning, given life, and then given a choice in the middle. And then in the end, those that reject and turn away, there's going to be condemnation and death. So this is how I like to look at this parasha because it really is a picture of everything from the beginning to the end. And then I'm going to end with talking about the living stones or what we're called in God's house. He's the builder of the house. And you're going to see me end in the New Testament with that. 
and how we are part of that kingdom of priests that this one is starting as. So let's begin. Before I do, many of us, um, when we first start studying the Old Testament, it's confusing because they use a lot of terms like the sons of Israel, and they talk about Jacob and Abraham and Esau, and, and they talk about Isaac and the Levites and the priesthood and the Kohanim, and your, your head is spinning with detail. So let me break it down into something very simple to understand. First of all, you know that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were considered the three patriarchs of our faith. So let's start with that third one, which was Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons, which were the 12 tribes. One of the 12 was Levi. And if you follow me, and you've been with me from the beginning, you know that Levi, the Levites, were given the right of the firstborn when Israel sinned against God with the golden calf. The firstborn should have been given to Reuben, the oldest of the 12. But instead, because he participated in that um, worship of the calf, the Israelites came and stood with Moses. He said, those that are with me, come stand with me. And it was all the Levites. So God gave them the right of the firstborn to serve within his temple and tabernacle. So now it's the Levites that do all the work or service within the tabernacle. Now, Levi had three sons. And the middle son, Kohath, had sons. And from one of his sons, Amram, came Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. So we're going to follow the Le Levitical tribe down through Kohath, then through Amram, then all the way down to Aaron, who would then be a specific subgroup within the Levites. And this subgroup are called the Kohanim. Only the Kohanim could offer the sacrifices on the altar and handle the blood. So very interesting that the Kohanim, the high priest, would be the only one once a year who would offer the blood for the atonement. So I hope you followed that. I put it in red so you could trace it all the way down. So when I'm talking about things happening with the 12 tribes and within the tabernacle, this breaks it down for you in a very simple way. So let's look at how they were set up in the desert. They were all the tribes set up around the tabernacle. So I broke it down for you this way. The sons of Jacob were all called Israelites, so all of them are Israelites. But only one of the sons, the Levites, were priests, and I put them in the service of the tabernacle. I put them in red. So this is the priesthood from Levi. And out of that, from Kohath, came the grandson Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, and they, the two men, Moses and Aaron, would be of the tribe of Levi, but Aaron would be like another subgroup that would be the only one who could go in and offer the um, animals and the blood on the altar in the Holy of Holies. So you see that Aaron and his sons were the only ones that could go to that place. And they were the Kohanim. So we have the Israelites, the Levites, the priests that would do all the work, and then the Kohanim, which only offer the sacrifices. So you can see that these priests here assisted Aaron in the work of maintaining the tabernacle and all its baking of the bread and the priesthood and the, the care of all the garments and the oil and the lighting of the menorahs and the cleanliness and the closing of the doors and all these things, all the priests participated in, but only the Kohanim 
could sacrifice. So that was Aaron and his sons. So I hope this gives you a quick picture of where we're going today when I talk about the priesthood and Aaron and that kind of a thing. So this parasha called Emor begins with Adonai speaking to Moses. And it says, speak to Moses about this. And he's going to talk about who is clean and unclean or holy and unholy, because at this point, the sacrificial system has begun. So he says, speak tenderly to the sons of Aaron. And, and what did he speak? He said, no man is to make himself unclean. And there were several things that could make um, one of these key people, the Kohanim, unclean and unfit then to go into the presence of God. So you could look at this as it applies to us. What would make us unclean to enter God's presence? And we're going to see that in the New Testament. So several things could make them unclean. Now, there are several rules regarding who the priest could marry, um, what the details were about the priesthood, the feast days, uh, what's clean and unclean. So all this, really, you can look at and say, well, I don't get it. How does that apply to me? Take the principles of these things, and hopefully I'm going to help you understand how they apply to us in the New Testament. So God's words given to Moses and then to Aaron and the priesthood, the Kohanim, weren't just strict laws by some rigid, distant lawmaker in the sky. They were spoken out of abiding love and concern to make sure, ultimately, the people had their sins atoned for. So all these rules were strict, but for a purpose that was loving behind those strict rules. So he wanted his people to meet with him and for them to be clean so that they could make atonement. So that applies to the New Testament. When Jesus came on the scene and started speaking of repentance, which would be the avenue and how they would be seen as clean in God's presence. So that's how those two connect. So anyone who was unclean was considered defiled. And so um, when Jesus came on the scene and started talking about repentance, those that didn't want to listen rejected his words and pulled away. And um, remember at the beginning of the book of Genesis, how we talked about the two seed lines? Well, we're going to get to that in a minute. I haven't talked about that much lately in the last several parasha, but it's important to go back to it today. So why was this important to be clean so they could be atoned for? What was the ultimate pur purpose? It was so that they could draw near and get to know God, to know him, not just somebody at a distance, but to know him personally and intimately. He wanted them to be able to draw near. Now, the priests would be the mediators between God and the people of Israel, and they would provide the means by which the people could draw near, which was through the blood. Okay, so they were bringing the offerings called a korban. And here's the word for korban. It comes from the word karav, which means to draw near. So these sacrifices that the Kohanim were going to bring and lay the blood of the sacrifice on the altar, this was so the people could be seen as clean and could ultimately draw near to God. So the whole thing is about God doing something for the people in order to draw them near for the sake of intimacy or love. See, that's the New Testament. And so I'm, I'm trying to break it down simply so that you can see all these rules of the Torah were so that man could draw near to God. Because why? He loved them. See, it says God's calling is to everyone, but not all will respond. Same way in the New Testament. So the tabernacle was to be the place where they could draw near 
And what was the purpose of that? So that they could be one in spirit and purpose. The oneness was to reproduce then the character qualities of God, and then that way show them to the world. And he could sustain the spiritual principles or seed new life to the next generation. Now, this is manifested many times in the New and Old Testament in the marriage covenant. Why? Because all these things in the Old Testament were brought together in covenant. So all the covenants of God from Adam all the way to Moses and David and the New Covenant were brought together in covenant for a purpose of love. And that's what the marriage is. Then the marriage would reproduce new life. You see, people. And the same way the seed would be carried on through people as the spiritual seed would be carried on. So the bride and groom were to be equal in value, but have different roles, each unique into their purpose and design. And together, they would be united in order to produce seed. Same way heaven and earth were united with God coming down and uniting with man in the form of the Messiah. So we see this principle in creation. We see the principle with the sun and the moon uniting to bring light for the day and the night as luminaries, right? And we see the seed in the soil coming together to unite, to create plants so that we could have more fruit and then within the fruit is seed. So all of God's spiritual unseen principles are manifested in what is seen. First in nature, things that are grown, crops, grain, wheat. We're going to get into that in a minute. And then ultimately in people as they come together and produce seed. So I hope I've made myself clear in these pictures. So that Oneness would um, bring about the priorities and the personal goals and purpose of God. So the Bible talks about this as being one in covenant or equally yoked. One is the other part of the equation. One plus one equals one. One new man, one new child one new seed. You see? So it's a composite unity of being one. And so this is why the Bible talks about being equally yoked so that you can produce more spiritual seed and physical seed. So God wanted to transform Israel, who is his bride, by showing her his love. He wanted to draw her near. And ultimately, it was for spiritual seed. They were to be a light to the nations. So this is seen as I see here in the feasts, which are talked about in this parasha. It's the feasts of Israel are all seen in this parasha of God speaking to Israel at this point in time. He's talking about having an abundant harvest. All the feasts revolved around this abundant harvest of Sowing, planting, reaping, agriculture, the harvest. All the feast days revolved around the harvest. Okay, we'll get into that more in a minute. So Israel's willingness to obey God would demonstrate their love then for God. So God's love would be shared. And then they were to share this kind of love with the nations around them. And that's what Jesus said in the New Testament when they asked him to sum up the law, the Torah. He said, love God and then love your neighbor and the stranger in your midst. So what's the purpose of showing others love? It's so that they can know the God of Israel. So it is to give them value so that they can see their purpose, their dignity, and God's love for them. And then many times by becoming a new creation, by receiving that truth, then they're given dignity, purpose, and a hope for the future. 
And our, our world is hurting right now. There's people that are in pain. And our acts of goodness, they need to see that these acts of goodness are motivated out of the heart of love, which God gave us. So that's our purpose. And that's God's purpose for all creation and all mankind. So that is a Christian's purpose. So the real purpose in loving others is to do it in God's name, not just so others can look at us and go, oh, you know, Rebecca Levis is such a nice person. Oh, that nice lady that lives up the street. No, they need to know where that comes from. It comes from God himself. See, basically, I'm pretty self-centered and selfish, but God when he came into my life at the age of 23, he began to transform Rebecca Levis, not because I'm perfect now, but because as I mature and grow in my faith, that seed then grows like a tree. And then that tree takes deep roots and then that tree provides fruit for others. And that's the whole purpose. We're compared to trees. So this is our purpose here. So when we experience God's love mingled with compassion and mercy for other people, then they want to draw near and they want to hear. So love always draws people near. So God wanted to bring redemption and spiritual healing to all nations. This is why it says many are called What's your call? But few are chosen, meaning he chooses to show mercy and grace to those who respond. So the chosen are those who respond, who have soft hearts towards him. So this redemption can be seen in the seven feasts of God called the Moedim or the appointed times. And, and the reason it's called appointed time is because it has to do with a time when God wants to meet with his people. So he arranged specific dates on their calendar to meet together, almost like uh, a special date of a, of a, uh, a newly, um, uh, a new bride and groom where he sets a date for their wedding, right? It's a special date. You don't want to be late for that. So God's, God has an appointment book where these dates of each of these feast days then could be circled on the spiritual calendar and remembered. So sometimes when I was um, first working as a nurse, as a joke, I always made sure people remembered my birthday and I'd go around and I'd sneak on their desk and circle January 5th and new employees would come and say, do we have a special meeting that day? I don't know. There's this red circle and everybody would laugh. They go, oh, that's Rebecca's birthday. She never wants us to forget it. And it, it was a joke, but it was kind of true, actually. Um, but <laughs> I love birthdays and I try not to forget my friend's birthdays because it's important. You know, the day of our birth and the day of our death are remembered in Judaism as a special day. So anyway, back to the feasts. So the feasts are called the Moed. And why? Because they were to be a witness to a special event when God would draw near to us. And isn't our birth a special event when that seed planted in the womb would burst forth at a specific time and then they're named and given special significance on that day. It's their birth day. And so it's to remember them. So Rebecca's birth day is an important day in my life. So it comes from the word ed, which means edda, which means a witness or a remembrance. So when you call somebody as a witness, re they remember the event, correct? It's also the word to adorn as in a bracelet. Why? Because when you put a bracelet on, it adorns your body and brings attention to that part of your body. So when we adorn a story as witnesses, we bring special detail to that event. And that's where that word comes from. 
In ancient times, all the feasts centered, as I said, around the harvest. They were times to remember God's faithfulness for what? To bring rain for their crops so they could have more seed and more plants and they would survive. So there's a, a scripture that said, God's word falls like rain. So you see God's word and his truth falls like rain falls on the soil to bring forth crops and grain. So from the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Feast of Shavuot, there was a 49 day counting period. And we are in that right now, today, uh, in our biblical calendar, the Jewish biblical calendar of the counting of the Omer. And the counting of the Omer is this 49-day period. And in Hebrew, it's called Sephirat HaOmer, meaning the counting of the Omer. So let's talk about that. Today, we're actually in the 29th day of the counting. So that's what the Shabbat is, the 29th day. Now, it's counted at night. Why? Well, because it was on the night of Passover that they went out at night with the fire. And so they count every night, another day of the Omer, up until the 50th day, which is Shavuot. And I'm going to tell you more about that in a minute. So the counting of the Omer begins on the second evening of Passover or the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then they count up 49 days till they hit Shavuot, known to us as Pentecost. Now, it's a time when you're to pray and focus on the character that's within us as it relates to others and to God. That's the modern way of thinking of this days of counting. It's to be a sobering time of self-reflection. Now, an Omer literally means to collect. So it's what they gather and um, tie up. And so the very first barley harvest, they would tie it up and dedicate that to God. And then they were to bring it to the temple as a sacrifice, a grain offering. And what that symbolized was that they were thankful for the rain that God sent for that first barley harvest. Then they would count the 49 days until Shavuot, which was the first day of the wheat harvest. So here we are, ancient days. They're in the promised land. Up grows the barley. And they were to take that and bring it to the priest. And he would wave it in four directions. Now, to me, that is God's faithfulness to the whole earth, north, south, east, west, to bring rain and to bring forth more seed for the harvest. That's our job as believers who follow the Messiah is that we're given God's truth. It's planted in us through the Holy Spirit. And then we share it with others to bring forth more believers, more seed, more people for the kingdom. And so these are beautiful parallels all through these feast days. I wanted to show you the feast days on um, a slide. Here they are. There's seven main feast days. And actually the Shabbat or the Sabbath is also considered a holy day. It's set apart. So you could literally say there's actually eight, but I'm just going to focus on the seven main feasts uh, within Judaism that they celebrate as holy days. You have the first one, Passover. You have unleavened bread, then first fruits, then Shavuot, or we know as Pentecost, then the Feast of Trumpets, or Rosh Hashanah, the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, and the Feast of Tabernacle, which is Sukkot. So right here, the second day of, right now, this entire season right here is called Passover because they're feasts within other feasts. So sometimes they all just get lumped under Passover, just so you know that. But so that you're not confused, let's break it down. First, there's one day of Passover, and then there's the second day called unleavened bread. And then it's this day that the counting begins on the 49 days, 
Okay, so this is the barley harvest and then the counting goes up to the wheat harvest here. Now notice what happens on Shavuot. There's something amazing here. This is why I love God's word because you'll see the consistency. You'll see the beauty of the story of all these feast days as it relates to the New Testament teaching. So let's look at that. When the wheat harvest was gathered in, this is what they waited for. The later rains that would gather in the wheat then God would be faithful then to bring them all the way through and they'd have enough food to last them through the winter until the next spring. And so the, the feast of Shavuot was when many important things happened. First, let's look at creation. It's the day when the sun and the moon were created. Now, think about that. The sun and the moon were given for light or revelation. And it was on Shavuot in the New Testament, that same day that the sun and moon were created, that's the same day that the Holy Spirit was given, which is a reflection of one more important thing, when the Ten Commandments were given to Moses. So look at this, creation, illumination, revelation, God's word given, revelation, truth, then the Holy Spirit given power to walk out the truth. It all happened on the same day. So the beauty of this cannot be missed. Okay, so let's continue through the story of this parasha. Now Shavuot is known as Pentecost in the Greek because penta means five and um, it's the Feast of Weeks. Now, what does that have to do with Shavuot? Well, Sheva is um, seven, and this 49-day period is seven sevens. And Shavuot is the plural of the number seven. So the Feast of Shavuot is the seven sevens, or the 49 days of counting. Okay. It's known as Israel's wedding day as well. And it was the same day that God gave the wedding vows or the words, the Ten Commandments. Okay, these are really empowerments. They're instructions to have the bride, Israel, have success and last through her days in the desert. So all this is about God sustaining, providing the seed, providing life, providing the generations to come. And as they celebrated these and remembered these all around the harvest, then when the seed of Abraham, the seed comes, which was prophesied by Moses, then we would recognize him as the seed of Abraham. So all these things are important to know. Since God was faithful then to bring rain in the spring, then he'd be faithful to send the later rains for the later harvest. This faithfulness of God is echoed in the words of God to Moses, to the Israelites, when he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Be strong. And then again, when they entered the promised land in Joshua 1, he said the same thing again. I will never leave you or forsake you. I will remain faithful the same as I was to bring the spring rains and the later rains. So see, God is showing us his faithfulness. So the counting of the Omer through these 49 days connects what to feasts? Passover to Shavuot. All right, from God redeeming them at night through the fire, leading the way, Revelation, and Shavuot being poured out on Pentecost power of the spirit to live it out. Revelation through the tongues of fire. Again, those two connected, important. My, many Christians are counting the days along with the Jewish people because for us, the Passover lamb and the pouring out of the spirit is the same connection for us as Christians. So we could teach this in our churches, shouldn't we? Yes, I think we should. So John the Immerser said, Behold the lamb, the Paschal lamb of Passover, 
who takes away the sins of the world. And then we read in the New Testament, and the word given on Pentecost, Shavuot, became flesh and what? Dwelt among us. So see, the word from Sinai became flesh in the Messiah. And he preached the same message of repentance so that they would draw near to God. See, this is all connected in the feast days. By the way, if you've never read about them, I highly recommend um, God's Feast Days found in this book. I have several books on the feast, but this is my absolute favorite. Now, Yeshua kept all the feast days and ultimately fulfilled them all by bringing us closer to God through his own blood. And the purposes of God were realized in the Messiah Yeshua, all symbolized in these feast days. So we as Christians should know every detail about them so that we can see it played out in the New Testament. So back to the Kohanim, they had strict rules about being clean and unclean. So quickly, I'm just gonna show you what um, would, uh, deem them unclean. First of all, contact with anything dead, okay? Death and life and cleanliness don't go together. So just think about clean, unclean, life, death, okay? And if he was to bury somebody, it couldn't be anyone except if it was um, a family member. Um, and he couldn't, he would be unqualified to serve if he was married illegitimately. So again, it's, it's about the covenant. So you can't um, have any contact with death or anything outside of covenant. That points to the New Testament. And then the animal itself couldn't have any defect. Well, what does that point to? The Messiah, for him to be qualified as the perfect sacrifice, he had to be sinless himself. So you see here three things, death, outside of covenant, and the wrong sacrifice. And Jesus fulfilled all of those as the Messiah. So this is important. It's set up here of what the high priest could and couldn't do, what would be considered clean and unclean. So it certainly applies to us today in the spiritual sense. So time for a little Hebrew grammar. Let me show you something. Here's the word omer, which means to bundle together. We already talked about that. And then look at the word for to speak or to say. It's the word amar. Now notice they share two letters and they sound alike. This in, in its verb form is amar. And this is amar. Here is Omer because that is the same word. They just change the vowels. So Omer and Amar are sound alikes. Now they're going to be related in some way. Now look, if I change the vowel pointing here from the A's to the E's, it becomes Emer and it becomes the bow or the top branch of a tree. Now remember I said we're compared to trees in the Bible. So the top of the tree is where the voice comes out. And isn't that what happens with humans? So the top of the tree is when the wind blows through the tree and the leaves quiver, you get a sound. And when the spirit within us, which is our wind, goes through our vocal cords and they quiver, we get words. See how these two are related? I just think it's incredible how God shows you unseen spiritual principles in things that are created. So in scripture, the wind is the ruach or the spirit. And that's where in Greek you get pneumo for lung, okay? So the wind comes out of us to give us our voice as the wind goes through the quivering leaves and gives a tree its voice. And so it also gives us not only our voice, but our song. And so think of it this way. The spirit in us gives our life new meaning, a new song. I love that. I'm going to look at my life as a song. So it's called a phonetic sound alike cognate. And words that sound alike will share two uh, letters. Here's two other words in Hebrew that um, share the same sound. 
avad and avad with two different beginning letters. And here, karav and karav with two different beginning letters. And I gave you their reference here in green where you can find them in your etymological dictionary, which is this one. I've showed that to you before by Samson Raphael Hirsch. We look up all of our Hebrew words in this. And it shows that there are sometimes similar meanings, but then they can be also opposite meanings by switching just one letter. And so I show you that here. Um, here we can serve God or we can perish. And here we can draw near or we have another word for um, an envelope or to cover or a garment, which means to um, draw near to us, right? And covers us. It's a garment. And it's the word for cherub, cherubim. And where does a cherubim guard and protect? The entrance to the garden and cherubs are on the curtain that is drawn between what's holy and most holy. And they're drawn by coverings of curtains. And so you see how they're related. Karav and Karav. All right. Oh, I could teach, uh, I could do a whole teaching just on these four words, but I won't. Okay, so Hebrew words kind of work like chemicals work in the, the DNA system. There's three DNA, and then they, they get switched and changed, and elements in chemistry work the same way where, you know, it's okay if you have three, but if you add a fourth or you add or take away from it becomes something different. That's the same way it is in the DNA. It's the same way it is in the elements in physics and in um, uh, mathematics. Everything works that way. And so what does Jesus say? And, you know, don't add to my word or take away from it. In other words, don't switch the letters up because the meaning is going to change. Just like, look, at here's water, H2O, but you add something and you get hydrogen peroxide and uh, you can't drink that. It's undrinkable and unthinkable, right? So I love that God takes principles and he relates them in the scene world. That's just uh, one example. So the high priest's function was to bring these grain offerings, draw near Karav, Korban, and both um, were to reflect these offerings. The animal sacrifices, both offerings were to reflect the grain and then the animal, two things coming together and being sat uh, satisfactory. Okay, the willing of the heart of the giver and the giver of the blood of the animal then would make that worshiper acceptable. So again, two things working together to make us acceptable. Now there's two words in Hebrew that mean one, by the way. One is echad, which means a unit, a composite unity um, of identical things, like a cluster of grapes. A cluster is one cluster, but there's a unity of things that are the same, which are grapes. Okay, a yachid is one unique thing. And it's solitary and by itself. So um, to bind, to make one would, would be taking separate things and putting them together. That would be ichad, but a, a yachid is one and only. So um, that's the kind of unity that God was bringing, two of the same things together. And that's why it says God is one. Many things that are the same, but under one title, God. Okay, that explains the Trinity to me. Okay, so yachid, to bind together to make one. Below is a related sound, sound alike word. Look at echad and echad you, with a different letter in the middle means to tie together and bind as one. So this was um, the word used in the binding of Isaac. So Isaac was bound to the wood, which is et's, same word for tree, as a sacrifice. 
Yeshua was bound to a etz tree as the acceptable sacrifice. Why was he acceptable? Because he was in covenant with the Father. He was perfect and clean. And he was within covenant. And he brought life. He gave his death to bring us life. He died in the darkness of the sun so that we could walk in the light of the S-O-N. Now, what is the sun in the sky? It's a ball of fire. So fire in the universe, which is the sun, reflects revelation. So as the sun begins to come out of darkness and rise, more and more revelation takes place, right? And we can see things clearly. So think about fire being revelation so that we can see clearly and walk. Okay, so Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Meaning I'm the life, I'm the way. I bring revelation and truth. Without me, you're in darkness. So there you have it. That's all the symbolism tied into one. Now, the Torah, God's word or the law, plus the giving of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, work together to bring us truth. So is the Torah bad and done away with? No, its truth remains. It's foundational. You don't get rid of it. But now you build on it in the New Testament with the words that you uh, Yeshua spoke, okay? And here's what Rabbi Shaul said in Romans. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is the Messiah, Lord, and believe in our heart that he raised him from the dead, you're saved. Okay, so I take the words of Jesus. I believe them in my heart, and that comes out as faith which makes me acceptable, and I will be saved. For it's in your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with my mouth that I confess that, and I'm saved by this faith. So as the scripture says, what is that? Go away. Anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. So the same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. So everyone who calls on him will be saved. So he calls all men to himself, but then we have to respond and call on his name because only he was perfect. Only he was the acceptable sacrifice. He was the living word. So the Torah became flesh and stood right in front of him. Wow. Wow. That's a walk around the kitchen. So then I did all these things that combine together and show that if we confess and we believe, we're justified. Jew and Gentile, both acceptable. We call on and trust in his name. Then we have no shame. And it's our heart and our voice together that we bring to his presence for worship. And it's our love and our gratitude that then make us bless others. So two things coming together as one always bring new life. And there you have it. <clears throat> now Yeshua referred to all those who would follow him as the bride and he would be the bridegroom. John's disciples asked Jesus, why don't your disciples fast? And what did Yeshua say? Why would they fast when they have the bridegroom with them? So see, just as God gave the law at Sinai to Israel as his uh, promises of the bridegroom, here in the New Testament, Yeshua says to his disciples, I'm the living word and you have me with you now. So why fast like you're waiting for the bridegroom? He says, I'm already here. So currently the groom called the Katan in Hebrew and the bride called the Kala are engaged. Okay. 
So we are sanctified and set apart. Just as an ancient culture, the bride and groom have a period of time where they're truly married, but not yet consummated. That's a picture of us in the New Testament. We are sanctified and set apart as the bride of the Messiah, but we won't actually consummate that relationship until we experience the wedding supper of the Lamb talked about in Revelation. That is the wedding supper, which is the time when we're united and acceptable to him as Echad, one. Ooh, that is powerful. So the bride and groom, the wedding supper and the Messiah will be realized in our eternal home. And that's why Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, for the bride. So he is God, the perfect matchmaker. He sets us apart. I call it the match made in heaven because he was outside of time and he already knew who would respond to his call. How about you? John 15, 16 says, Yeshua chose us before the foundation of the earth, meaning he already knew in eternity past who would respond to his call. And we'll experience that relationship in everlasting life with that everlasting covenant. Now, 2 Thessalonians 2.13 also says, Yeshua chose us as the first fruits to receive the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what we did. And now his spirit resides in us. Now, if you go into the New Testament in Galatians 3, it says, so in Yeshua HaMashiach, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into the Messiah and have been clothed with his righteousness, basically. So there's neither Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or free female, you are all one. All of us like those grapes in the cluster, we are all one in Messiah. So if you belong to the Messiah, then you truly are Abraham's seed or heirs of the early harvest and heirs according to his promise of the later harvest. And look, we are all Abraham's seed and in the New Testament, that word is sperma. So see, we're all born from above by the seed of the Holy Spirit in us. So all of this grain and agriculture and feast days are all manifestations established in space and time so that we could understand spiritual principles. 1 Peter 2, 4 says, as, to, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by people, but chosen by God and precious to him, you yourselves are living stones and being built into a spiritual house to be priests set apart for God to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to him through Yeshua. So, our sacrifices now are as we bring ourselves close to him through prayer, through worship, and then he speaks to us and we carry out his plan on earth. Now, to you who keep trusting, he is precious. But to those who reject him, to not, who don't receive that call, but reject it, the very stone that the builders rejected Israel, the Messiah, he has become now the chief cornerstone of the building. And that's the building that God is making on earth to all nations. So everyone who believes in him from every nation, tongue, and tribe is part of that stone of God building his house, his kingdom here on earth. And then our hope is for the kingdom to come, which will be the eternal one. So did you know that there's some 
amazing principles that are still carried out in Greece today, that when they build something, they'll, they'll kill an animal and they'll spill the blood and then put the chief cornerstone there. And sometimes they use wine or oil or grapes or whatever, symbolizing produce, isn't that interesting, and blessings. So you see it in the ancient culture, these cornerstones represented um, a significant thing. Something was placed under them to give them blessings. And think about in the New Testament when they call the Messiah the chief cornerstone. It would be his blood that would be shed that would be the beginning of the building. So he was that cornerstone. And then God builds on that, his building. Isn't that something when you look at it that way? So in conclusion, all the feasts, the sacrifices, the priestly functions, all the feasts of the Lord, all point to Yeshua, who came to redeem this very broken world. So the counting of the Omer is done, like I said, at night, because they came out of the darkness. And we come out of darkness when we um, receive Jesus as the Messiah. So during this time, it's celebrated. Um, in Israel as this, on the 33rd day of that counting, a special day called Lag Be Omer. And I show that to you because I wanted you to see what this was all about. Because remember last year when they had that stampede on this special day, when all the ultra Orthodox Jews gathered during the feast of that 49 days of counting on the 33rd day, where they went to this town called Moron to celebrate um, Rabbi Akiva's death. Um, they had that trampling and, and the mob tried to get out all at once and many people died. Well, this has a history of um, the first century of Rabbi Akiva, who was the contributor, the chief contributor to the oral law, a plague had broken out during his life and 24,000 students of his died from this plague. But on the 33rd day of this 49 days of counting, the plague stopped and no one else died after that 33rd day. So really two things are celebrated that day. And so it's on that day, during this 49 day of counting, it's only on the 33rd that they can hold a wedding. And traditionally, they cut the, the boy's first haircut when he's three on the 33rd day called Lag Be Omer. So I wanted to give you some of the, the Jewish um, indications of that day so that um, when you're talking to your Jewish friends and they talk about um, they talk about their feast days, you'll have an understanding of what that's about. So now that we've talked about the fire, we've talked about truth, we've talked about what is acceptable and unacceptable, I'm going to go and just show you two principles in the New Testament with that same theme um, that Jesus came up uh, to teach in the New Testament. So let me come out of here. Okay, so this is our 32nd week of looking in the Chronicles of the Messiah, looking at the four Gospels. And today we're going to look at the baptism of fire, because we just talked about how um, this period in history was tying Passover to the uh, pouring out of God's Spirit. And so let's look at the baptism of fire in the New Testament and what that has to do with um, Jesus coming as the word of God uh, to the house of Israel. So in Luke 12, 49, Jesus said, I have come to send fire on the earth and how I wish it was already burning. I have to be immersed in a certain immersion and how distressed I am until it's complete. Now, when you read that, you just like, what? what the heck is he talking about here? That seems so weird to our Gentile ears. But in the scripture, fire has many appearances and it's associated with God's presence, his baptism by fire, or it could be his wrath. It could also be revelation, like I talked about, or judgment. So many things are associated with fire. So Jesus says, 
I have come to send fire on the earth and I wish it was already burning. Now, what he was referring to, let's go back and look at some of the places where you look at fire in the Torah and then look at it here in the New Testament with these words of Jesus in Luke 12. So fire, we saw that in the burning bush, right? And what did Moses do? He drew near to the fire, okay? God wanted to speak to him with revelation, fire, God's presence, revelation, okay? Then when there was a, um, a time in numbers where men came with strange fire into God's presence, God didn't ordain it. And 250 of them were struck dead. So at that time, fire was associated with God's wrath his holy justice. And then fire from heaven, from Elijah, when he brought down fire and um, he consumed 50 men at a time, okay? These fake prophets, false prophets. So man's work will be revealed, it says in 1 Corinthians, with fire. And then there'd be a baptism of the spirit and fire on Pentecost. When the Messiah comes with his angels the second time, he said he'll come and blazing fire he'll come. And he will be like a refiner's fire. This is spoken about in Malachi 3.2. So here's all the places where God's revelation, judgment, or wrath would all have to do with fire. Okay, so now let's fast forward into the New Testament, and Jesus is speaking. He says, I've come to send fire, meaning I'm going to judge something, and it's going to come as fire, meaning, number one, he's going to die a painful, stinging death on, uh, on Passover, and so that fire that he's speaking about is a burning away of the penalty of sin, which is death. And it would happen that burning away would then free us to walk then in the light. So that burning away that he's speaking of is his actual death for our death. Him dying on that tree in the darkness of the sun, remember it went black, so the light of the world was snuffed out, and he died in the darkness so that we could walk in the light of the sun, S-O-N and S-U-N, because it's the sun that brings revelation. So see what fire, how important these symbols are in life and in our culture? So what was the immersion that he had to undergo? Well, he talked about that is senecho in Greek. And it meant, he says, I'm distressed about this. That word distressed is here, meaning to be compressed as if I can't get out of this. I'm, I'm committed to it. And that's, he was held captive to what? To the will of God. See, he perfectly lived out the Torah, and then he willfully died that horrible death in the dark so that we could walk in the light. So this immersion was into the hands of sinful men. His flesh and his heart would feel that agonizing pain of man's wicked words and vicious wounds from man's wrath and rage against him. That was the immersion that he was talking about here in Luke 12. And he said, the fire is already kindled. In other words, it's begun. Here he is, he's, he's preached repentance and there's those that respond and those that didn't. So that judgment was about to take place, but not on people, it would take place on him. So he said, it's already been kindled. And so his incarnation, preaching of the truth, and now he talks about until all is accomplished, meaning until it's complete. And that's why on the cross, he said, it is finished. He did it once for all mankind. So God's fire was first demonstrated as a supernatural calling, right? With Moses in the burning bush. 
And that started everything rolling. And then Moses prophesied that someday God would send a prophet like me, Moses says, to Israel. And that Israel should what? Listen to him. So Moses' first calling came with fire and he responded. The disciples, their calling came with fire and they responded. So God's revelation or truth is always a calling to you and I, and we can respond or we can reject it. So Malachi says, who can endure the day of his coming? And this is his second coming, and it is soon. Who can stand when he appears? Because it'll be like a refiner's fire. And the Bible says that everything that's been hidden will be uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of whom we will give an account. So both scriptures point to fire, the fire from Moses and the fire, the refiner's fire that Jesus will use when he judges all of us in the final days. So that is the refiner's fire talked about in Luke. And then Jesus said, we're going to talk about peace and division. Jesus said he came not to bring peace, but a sword. What did he mean by that? In Ephesians 6, it talks about the sixth piece of putting on the full armor of God. Paul discusses the sword, meaning the spirit. So Jesus says, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. And that spirit would then be released after his death. And so that sword would cause division. What was the sword? The sword was his truth. It represents the word of God. So for a Roman soldier, this sword was an offensive weapon. So the truth of God would offend some. It would be aggressive. And so Jesus says he knew when he came that his words would be like a sword, like a Roman uh, offense. It would offend some who had hard hearts, but those who had soft hearts would draw near. And so again, this peace and division, Jesus knew he would come to bring that separation. And nothing has changed today. The truth of Jesus in our world still brings division both in Israel and in our culture around the world. So again, you see what we saw in the beginning. Remember back in Genesis, the two seeds would be at enmity. It said the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman would always be at enmity. And that, that would be those that would respond to God and those who would reject God's word or his truth. So God's word is living and it's still active. It says he compares it to a sword. It separates man's soul from his spirit as joint from marrow. So Jesus came to cause division. His second time, he's coming to bring peace. He will judge the world first, but he is not willing that anyone should perish but for all to come to repentance. That's his desire. So I pray that you would draw near through the teaching today that Jesus was the Paschal Lamb and he died and he paid the penalty for sin and removed the penalty of death by taking it on himself so that we could walk in the light of that truth. And that revelation then makes us clean. And he declares us righteous. Therefore, he's free then to pour out his spirit on us. And we get to walk in his spirit. And we get to share it with others. So that's um, the message for today. May God bring you into his presence through the power of his Holy Spirit. And may you say yes to the call of Jesus on your life. Shabbat Shalom.